Hi, I'm Ulf Riebesel. Did you know that half the oxygen we breathe comes from tiny phytoplankton flourishing in the sunlit surface layer of the ocean? These are all single-celled microalgae, tiny little machines that use the sunlight and the available nutrients to grow at enormous rates, a new generation almost every day. Their total production rivals that of all land plants although their total biomass is a hundred times less than that of land vegetation. So let's take a closer look at these amazing creatures and the role they play in our planet's carbon cycle. First, how can it be that phytoplankton are so much more productive per unit biomass than land plants? Well, think of what land plants have to do to harvest light, water and nutrients. They need roots, stems, branches, leaves, each component containing lots of structural material, biomass which is not active in photosynthesis. In contrast, phytoplankton don't have to overcome the same forces of gravity. They drift almost neutrally buoyant in the surface ocean, so they don't need all those structural components. Also, they are surrounded by the nutrients they need for growth. A single cell combines all necessary parts to take up nutrients, capture sunlight, photosynthesize, grow and reproduce. They are like miniature photosynthesis machines. To build their biomass, they need lots of carbon dioxide. That's shown in this graph by the red arrows going into the ocean. In fact, phytoplankton consume 10 times more carbon dioxide every year than humans release into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuel. But much of that is released again very quickly by the algae themselves through aspiration, by zooplankton eating the algae, and by the bacteria consuming the remains. Some of the leftovers of this plankton feast sink out of the surface ocean to greater depth, like breadcrumbs falling off the table. On the way down, they are slowly degraded by bacteria, thereby releasing the carbon and nutrients in deeper layers of the ocean. This process pumps carbon from the surface to the deep ocean, and that explains why it's called the biological carbon pump. A very small portion of the carbon export reaches the seafloor where it feeds the deep sea fauna or accumulates as long-term carbon storage in the sediments. So it's clear from this that the biological pump is an important driver in our climate system. Over the past decades, scientists have therefore spent quite a bit of effort trying to quantify the sinking flux of carbon and other elements through the biological pump. What they found is that the proportion of carbon fixed by phytoplankton that makes it into the deep ocean can vary from less than 1% in some unproductive regions of the open ocean up to 50% in some highly productive areas where massive phytoplankton blooms occur. And the pump's efficiency is very much dependent on what phytoplankton are flourishing and what food web develops in their wake. Scientists believe that variations in the strength and efficiency of the ocean's biological pump played a key role in climate changes in Earth history. For example, the recurring pattern from glacial to interglacial times, which characterized our planet's climate over the past couple of million years. From the warm interglacials, where the atmospheric CO2 partial pressure was about 300 ppm, about one third of the CO2 was gradually taken out of the atmosphere and stored elsewhere on our planet. Scientists believe that the most likely storehouse for this CO2 is the deep ocean, and that the biological carbon pump is the vehicle responsible for transporting the CO2 into the deep ocean storehouse. To switch from glacial maxima with their low pCO2 values of 180 ppm back to the high CO2 interglacials, the gate of the ocean storehouse must be opened again and the CO2 released back into the atmosphere. What turns the switch around, so what causes the shift from atmospheric to deep ocean storage, still puzzles scientists. What is clear, however, is that ocean plankton biology is a key driver in the Earth's climate system and that the climate in turn is a primary factor 
in controlling ocean productivity. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, humans have dramatically perturbed the natural carbon cycle. The atmospheric CO2 has already increased by 100 ppm over the pure industrial maximum, an additional increase of the same magnitude as glacial interglacial variations. This increase most likely double, will most likely double or triple over the next few decades and further amplify climate change. This will give rise to major changes in the ocean's environmental conditions. With ocean warming and ocean acidification as the two most prominent and probably most influential changes. In combination, these environmental changes will trigger major alterations in plankton composition and productivity. For example, warming and acidification are expected to favor small phytoplankton species and to excel the recycling of carbon in the surface ocean. So how will the ocean's biological carbon pump respond to these changes? Will it continue sequestering the same amount of carbon into the deep ocean? As shown in this graph, the wheel of CO2 fixation via photosynthesis and CO2 release via respiration and remineralization may turn faster. But the net result would be a weakening of the biological carbon pump. Less carbon would be transported to depth, more of it would remain in contact with the atmosphere. Our understanding of the biological consequences of ocean change is still insufficient to make reliable predictions of these changes. And there may be aspects in this complex interaction between the climate system and ocean biology which we haven't spotted yet. But the science on ocean change biology is in full swing, so we are likely to soon hear about new discoveries from this fascinating field of science. What we've learned from all this? Well, one key message from this is that the strength and the efficiency of the biological carbon pump very much depends on the productivity and composition of the phytoplankton community. Both plankton composition and productivity are expected to change under future ocean conditions. It doesn't take much imagination to conclude that the biological carbon pump is not going to continue at the same rate in the future ocean. What if the pump loses strength and more carbon stays in the atmosphere? This would amplify the human-induced global warming. And this is what scientists refer to as a positive feedback. But positive in this context doesn't mean good. A positive feedback works as an amplifier. It makes bad things worse. It is these positive feedbacks that scientists are so worried about.